Hello everyone, on today's video we're going to be getting started with our Dead Reckoning tutorial. So uh, Dead Reckoning is the process of basically measuring distance and time and basically using different types of waypoints along a route to determine where you are, when you need to hit it, and roughly what the conditions are. Now this is such a process to do, I'm actually going to be breaking this video up into three different pieces so that we can go ahead and do it safely. The first thing we like to do uh, when we're doing dead reckoning is we go ahead and uh, double check our flight planning checklist here. Now, there will be a copy of this checklist at the bottom of the page that we can kind of use. The first thing we usually do, of course, is pick our destination, we calculate our route, we get our weather, and then we start doing all the crazy nasty stuff, which is going to be reserved for the second video in this particular series. So let's go ahead and start at the tippy top. So as you remember from last time, we basically did a quick little pilotage exercise traveling directly from Groton all the way up to Hartford, Connecticut. During this process, of course, uh, we discovered how hopeless it was to try to use different types of highways in order to find where we were going. As a matter of fact, it was so bad, we actually got pretty bad lost, even though we did manage to find our destination in the end. So when we do go to pick our particular waypoints and stuff like that, we want to pick something that's going to be a little bit more visible during our flight today. So first things first, we want to choose our destination. We're going to be going into Hartford today. We're going to double check to make sure it's open. Uh, we know that it is an open airport. If we wanted to check it directly, we could actually just call up the AFD real fast, and we can confirm all the different details that we need to looking at it right away. Next thing I'd like to do is a control tower. It is runway lights. Ah, uh, this is a really big problem at night. You can see our runway two has our runway lights. We have a Pappy, it's a four light version. You can see our glide angle is gonna be four degrees. Our touchdown, our threshold is 411 feet, which is significant. And of course there are trees in the way as well. We can also see that we have some pretty good intense lighting on the other side as well. The other runway, however, is not lit. Actually, I should say, my bad. It's high intensity runway lighting right here. And that basically tells us everything we need to know as far as approaching at night. Now, if this particular airport was set up in a way that we'd have to use the radio in order to turn the lights on, you'd also get this information provided for you in the airport remarks here. So we're pretty good so far. Uh, restrictions. Okay, restrictions. TFR is very important. I'm going to zoom out a teeny tiny bit and see if there are any TFRs, which are temporary flight restrictions. I noticed there's one over here. There's a flight hazard. This is actually a really interesting flight hazard. It was an old fireworks factory that actually keeps detonating once in a while, hence the hazard. I can also come over here. I notice there's a football game going on right here. We don't want to be flying through that without getting in a lot of trouble. Coming down to New York City, uh, we can see that there's a VIP down here, which is a blocking off this zone here. Coming down over in this way, we notice there's another football game. We have a VIP. We have a security. And, of course, um, in the United States, at least, we have this one, which is around our capital state, our capital city, which, as you can see, is a seriously serious zone. We are not going through any of those zones, so I don't need to worry about any of that today. So let's take a look at what we have next. Actually, we should take a look for making sure we're not accidentally flying through anything we're not supposed to also. Coming along this way, looking for any airspaces we're going to be violating, and I don't see any at this time. Our nearest airspaces in this case are up at Bradley International, and I notice there's a much, much smaller airspace down here at Hartford, which is basically going to be restricting our ability to get in and out of this particular zone as well. So, so far, it looks pretty good. Ah, NOTAMs. So now, if you're in Europe or using the rest of the world, getting NOTAMs is going to be a little bit trickier of a process. It's not to say you can't get them. It's just to say it's going to be a little bit trickier. So what a notice is, NOTAM is, is a notice to airmen. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to type in where we're going, and we're also going to be typing in where we were coming from. Let's go ahead and do a quick search. And let's see what we've got for notices. Okay, here, let's see. This is uh, giving us, uh, so we have them broken down by class. In this case, let me organize it by class real quick. So these are all aerodrome notices. This is all at Groton. It's telling us that the pavement is not grooved. For those of you who are interested, that basically means that if it's wet, it's going to be very difficult to stop on. Uh, let's take a look real quickly here. We have non-standard surface markings. Again, this is at Groton. Fortunately, none of this is at Hartford. Let's see, Hartford has asked us quite nicely that if you're going to be doing practice instrument approaches, if you actually open up this thing, it'll tell you that it prefers you to use them at certain times of day, just as a way to stop blocking up VFR traffic. Typical. Uh, let's see here. We have some LTAs. Again, these are just general notices. We can see that PVD, which is way too far away from us, getting a brand new runway. Sounds pretty good. We have tons of obstructions along the way. None of them are really particularly low, so I'm not worried about it too much. Let's see here, procedural change. Since we're not flying this as an IFR flight plan, we don't really have to worry about instrument approach procedures. But if we want to pick one of these randomly, 
we can take a look right here and see that this particular VOR, Amendment 10C, it's giving us some new minimums, which makes sense. And again, the purpose of these NOTAMs are just to give you general important information for your particular airport. So in this case, I didn't really see any NOTAMs that I'm worried about. During the winter, of course, you're going to get NOTAMs warning about snowbanks. You're going to get things about runways that have been damaged. Everything you could possibly imagine here. So we're looking pretty good. Time to choose our route. All right, let's go back to Sky Vector. In the real world, when we choose our route, we usually just draw a straight line. So now what we want to do is take a look at our particular route, and we want to make sure we can get over any obstacles along this particular route. Taking a quick look here, I can see that we have these very, very tall towers at 1,500 feet. That's actually significantly high. We may not actually be able to safely clear these particular towers, so we're going to have to keep an eye out for them. If we want to be a little bit safer, we could follow the highway a little bit up and then cut across. We could, of course, if we want to do the pilotage method, zip over to the Connecticut River and go north. But in general, this is actually a very serious obstacle for us in the real world. Let's go ahead and take a look along the line here. Anything unusual? I don't see anything too weird here. Ah, see these big blue numbers? They're going to be dictating what our minimum altitude is going to be to safely clear all obstacles in this particular range. You'll notice the reason that this is 1,700 feet is because of this guy. Now, as we cruise along here, I can see the closest nasty one is 2,200 feet which means no matter what I do, I want to make sure my cruise altitude is going to be greater than 2,200 feet. We'll deal with that in a minute, though. Now we're going to go ahead and identify some checkpoints. So this is the fun part. Now we have to look at our route here and decide what we're going to be able to see from the air that we can use as reference points to go ahead and make sure we're still on task. So we want to keep these about 10 miles apart, usually less if visibility is not good. So the first checkpoint I'm going to pick, of course, is that everybody remembers this from our pilotage video, how incredibly difficult it was to see this particular obstacle. I'm going to pick it anyway, because in the real world, we usually you don't have any difficulty. So if you're using Sky Vector, I can just go ahead and left click it, hit plan. So that's going to be my first checkpoint. So I'm just going to do a quick little mark right here. So we need another checkpoint about 10 miles away. I'm liking this drag strip and this cluster of lakes directly to my left. So I'm going to pick that as my next checkpoint. That's going to be my left. And that looks pretty good. They're about, what do we got? Nine nautical miles apart. Good, good, good. All right, we want another checkpoint. Oh, this one's going to be tough. I noticed there's some pretty strong power lines going through the middle. If we just, just divided everything by two, we could do something like, oh, uh, geez, this is going to be difficult. Rocky Hill is pretty easy to see, but how are you going to identify it? We've got this little grass strip. Let's see what this does for us as a checkpoint goes. Uh, that's a pretty short checkpoint, but we'll probably be able to see Hartford from that point anyway. So that's going to be our three checkpoints. They're going to be pretty easy to find. I mean, the nice thing about this little airport here is you're never going to find it from the air, but this little lake on the left, we will. We'll also be able to identify this mountaintop, and we'll also be able to identify that particular location here. Coming down here, this will be very easy to identify because we have a huge intersection on the right, and we also have a huge group of lakes on the left. And like I said before, this is actually a very effective one too, and there's actually a lake right here, so it's actually very easy to see. Now, for those of you who are Google Maps fans, this is even easier because you can just use, draw this line normally and take a look along Google Maps to see if there's anything incredibly obvious that we could be using. All right, those look like pretty good waypoints for me. Uh, we're going to ignore that, and now we have to plot it. We already plotted it on our chart. We're now good to go. So one thing I am going to do, though, is I'm going to go ahead and take a look at my flight planning form. Uh, this is the form we're going to end up using in order to do all of our dead reckoning calculations. Uh, there will be a copy of this for those of you who like to play with it yourself. The real one of these forms looks just like this, but you have to do it with a calculator, which in my opinion is a little bit too much work, so I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. So I'm going to go back to my flight planning checklist. Now it's time to start going ahead and uh, planning out our weather here. Oh boy, I hate weather. Weather makes things so much more complicated than it really needs to be. If you're using real world weather, by the way, some of this is going to be a little tricky because of the way that Microsoft Flight Simulator actually interprets weather. But we, that being said, we can do a pretty good job here. So first things first, I'm actually going to go back to my flight planning fan. I'm going to go ahead and fill out all my different little waypoints that I started with. Uh, we have some radio stacks. We're going to go down here. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Our next position was we agreed that it was going to be a cluster lakes in drag strip. Drag strip, lakes. And our next waypoint we decided was going to be that teeny tiny little airport. This is Simon River, uh, Salmon River, sorry, What's Simon River. I've never heard of that before. Salmon River, lakes. And of course, our final is going to be Hartford itself. We're going to worry about all this stuff in the next video because this is going to get messy very quickly. So next thing you know, we want to go ahead and take a look at our weather. Oh boy, weather. Oh, like I was saying a minute ago, this, this starts to get pretty nasty. 
So the first thing we need to do is determine what the METARs are. A METAR is just our ability to determine what the meteorological conditions are at the surface level at a given airport. Now the good news is if you're taking off in five minutes, you can actually use Sky Vector to get an exact reading of what your METAR is. Otherwise, what you can do is you can go over to the AWC, you can go up to the tippy top, click on METAR, and then type in your particular airport. Or in this particular case, look at how handy this is. I can just zoom in on the map too. Like right now, I can see at Groton, New London, we have about, mm, let's see here. Groton, New London, this is the time. The winds are coming at 270, that's due west at three knots. Visibility is 10 statute. This conditions are clear. Temperature is 16.2.10. Altimeter is 3025. Well, that just means we have a very, very high pressure. This is a great day to fly. And then we can, of course, we can get some information on all sort of sea level pressure and stuff like that. So that's good information to know. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take that information, go to my weather log, and I'm just going to go ahead and dial that information directly. You can go ahead and put this pretty much anywhere you need to at this particular point. So we all notice ceiling is unlimited, visibility was 10 statute, and no precip. Awesome. That's going to make our life much safer. What we also want to do is we want to find out what the forecasted weather is going to be. That's called a TAF. But before I do that, I'm going to go find where my METAR up in Hartford is as well so that we can accurately go ahead and determine this. So we have no wind, great visibility, great temperature, and clear skies. Oh, you never get such a lucky day to go flying. So it's basically exactly the same. Now, these two middle ones, we'd have to get by getting information between these two positions. The good news is, since this is such a short flight, we can basically use whatever this conditions is for the first half of the flight and use this for the second half of the flight. So I'm going to come back in here and basically copy that as well. We should now go ahead and take a look at our forecasted condition. Forecasted conditions are done with a TAF. That's a terminal area forecast. So what I can do here is I can come up here like this, hit TAF. You can get this for the entire world, by the way. Now, if I go down to Groton, I can see my TAF. Uh, let's see here. This is, uh, notice this is all Zulu time, so you have to watch out. It looks like the wind is going to stay uh, three knots, where our visibility is going to drop, and we're going to be getting some scattered clouds. So let's go ahead and type that in. So uh, let's see. Ceiling uh, is going to be scattered clouds, but we don't know anything about the altitude of those scattered clouds, which is actually a bad thing for us. I was really hoping we could change. Oh, look at this. Looks like we're going to have a nasty little storm in the afternoon. You're going to have two statute miles. You're also going to get broken. You're going to get scattered. And then later on, it increases. Why do we care about the altitude of those scattered clouds? Well, the reality is we have to make sure that we stay underneath those scattered clouds at all times. Now, if we accidentally pop into them or climb over them, we're going to be in a situation where we're no longer doing VFR flying. So we have to keep that in the back of our head. And I think it was, uh, what did we say, four-mile visibility? I'm going to take a quick look here. Six-mile visibility. Six SM. So we're going to use that for the first half, and we're going to go ahead and calculate this for Hartford as well. We'll go grab ourselves a TAF. Usually in the morning, it's the best time of day to fly. Turbulence tends to be the least also. Oh, we don't have Hartford. Oh, no, that's a bummer. Not really. Because now we can just go over to Hartford, or I should say Bradley. We can use this information here. Let's see here. Uh, at 730, it looks like it's going to be winds. Looks like it's going to be about the same. Ah, beautiful. Few clouds at 25,000 feet. That's wonderful news. That means we're probably going to be able to get in here. Scattered at 25,000, 6 SM. So visibility is not going to be great today. But at the very least, we know the cloud level is going to be way, 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 way above our heads. All right, let's take a look at the next item. We're going to need to figure out the winds aloft. Oh, man, do I hate this step. Now, for those of you who are big fans of some of the other products that you can use for this purpose, you could always come over here and you could do Windy TV, and you could come over here like this, and then you could zoom way in, and then you could be like, oh, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at, you know, Groton time here. Go ahead and click my mouse real fast. We can see clearly that it looks like the winds are coming out of, uh, looks roughly the southwest, looks like, you know, the west, and then it shifts a little bit kind of southwest. This is not accurate enough. As a matter of fact, it's so inaccurate that if you try to sit here and measure this as a precise angle, you'd actually be off significantly, and that would have a big impact on our actual flight planning. Instead, what we can do is we can go back over to the AWC and go to winds and temps. We can actually select our particular location. Now, one of the things I love about this is you can dial what altitude your winds are at. So right now, I'm setting my wind level to 3,000. Now, notice our takeoff position is not listed here. Ah, oh, I hate it when it does that. So as a result, how do we figure out what our wind is at 3,000 feet here? Well, you got to do some interpolation. I hate to say it. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at Hartford, 290 at 16 knots. Come over to JFK, 280 at 13 knots. 
So let's just do the math there. So 280, 29 or 0, so that's going to be about 285. And if this is going to be at 13 knots, that's going to be at 16 knots. 285 at 15 knots would be a pretty safe guesstimate. So if we come back over here, we'll say 3,000 feet. It's going to be 285 at 15 kn. Now, the nice thing here is that we know we'll use this from the first part of my en route. And we'll say at the destination, now we can use the information we got over at Bradley, which is a 290016. It's really important that we get this extremely accurate. Another thing that you want to watch out for is that when you get these wind numbers, that you get them in a way that they're coming from true north. If you get them from magnetic north, in this part of the world, um, that's a 14 degree difference, which is drastic. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that as well. Now, 285 at 15 knots is a heck of a headwind for this particular flight. Uh, let's take a look at the wind up at 6,000. Maybe it gets a little better. All right, let's see what we got here. So close that. Uh, let's see here. Remember, by the way, this wind is only set to whatever time you have it set to right now. In this particular case, it's 1800 Zulu. If you actually fast forwarded, you'd get a different wind. So you can see the wind actually shifts as the day goes on towards the north. Not unusual. All right, 6,000 feet. Uh, JFK gets us 290.13. Uh, BDL gets us 270.18. So it's uh, 275 at 16 would be roughly what it is. So just come in here, go to control enter. I don't think I like this very much. 275 at 16. So go ahead and copy that information. And of course, when we get to the destination, we can use the destination wind directly. Again, this is 6,000 feet. 270 at 18 is going to be our destination wind. Yes, this is about as accurate as you used to be able to get it. Oops, escape. This is about as accurate as you used to be able to get your winds. You can actually use other sources to get it more accurate, and I'll show those off in just a minute. 6,000 is going to be 270 at 18 knot, and we'll go ahead and copy that. Remember, if your route is much, 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 much longer, this is going to have to end up being basically a running average over time. That's kind of making me slightly insane. Okay, so what altitude do we fly this flight at now that we have wind? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Before we do that, don't forget icing and freezing. So we can come back over here. We can say, get me some icing. Let's see if there's any icing in our zone. I don't think there's going to be any. There's no sigmets. Let's see what the forecast icing is. This is valid to an altitude, I believe it says it right on here, 1,000 to 30,000. No icing. So none. Lovely. None. We're just going to say none, 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 none. Uh, let's take a look at turbulence. Might as well check that out too or at it. We'll hit up turbulence. Uh, we'll see if there's any graphical ones we need to be worried about. Looks like we're going to be getting light turbulence. So that's not going to be too bad. So I'll call this light. All right, looks good. Position of fronts, highs and lows. I'm not worried about this that much because our flight is so short. But if we wanted to, you could actually go back and actually study where all your high pressure fronts are and everything along the... <laughs> Look at all the airplanes going to England. That's great. You could actually see the position of fronts and I can see there's not any nasty ones that are going to be affecting us too much. So I'm just going to say uh, far west because <laughs> it's basically the reality. Uh, there were no notums so far and we're pretty much in great shape now. So let's go ahead and take a look at our list. We've checked this, pilot reports, uh, air mets, winds and temps. Good. Now it's time to pick our cruise profile. So what altitude do we travel at? Rule number one with altitudes in VFR, you can't go through clouds. We have to stay 500 feet below them at all times. That would mean that if we want to safely take this flight, since our clouds are at 25,000 feet forecasted, they're going to be so much above us that they don't impact us. So that is a non-issue. But in this part of the world, especially during the warmer months, the clouds are typically at about two or 3,000 feet. So none of our flights can even get past those altitudes because of the stupid cloud layers. You don't want to be flying through clouds in VFR. That's the whole point. And again, we want to be able to see our obstacles, so we don't want to be flying over the clouds either. So in this case, uh, we know we can probably go as high as we want. However, remember, we're dealing with a Cessna 172 here, so that's only about 700 feet per minute. So if my total flight is about 20 minutes, and I take uh, that long to get up to, say, 6,000 feet, by the time I get up to altitude, I'm going to have to come right back down. The general rule is you don't want to be climbing any higher than 10% uh, of your total flight time. So if my total flight time is, a, like I said, about 25 minutes or so, my total climb time shouldn't exceed two minutes, which ironically is about 1,500 feet. However, if you remember this one over here, 2,200 feet, but do you remember this one is 1,500 feet.
So in this particular flight, we're going to have to get over all of that. So 2,500 feet is our minimum. Now, in the United States, you have different rules as far as what altitudes you have to travel at. Basically, if you're heading towards the west and you're over 3,000 feet, you need to be traveling on even altitudes plus 500. If you're traveling east, you need to do odd altitudes plus 500. So in this case, if we stay under 3,000 feet, nobody cares what altitude we fly at unless we're less than 2,200 feet. So um, where this gets kind of exciting, for those of you who want to do the extra challenge, if we come over here, this is always kind of fun to look at. Notice these minimum on-road altitudes. <laughs> it's just so, it's insane if you really think about it. But anyway, we're going back to what we're uh, doing here. Oh, Michigan. Uh, zoom back in. Okay, so 2,500 feet is pretty good because that's about, it's going to take us three and a half minutes to climb that particular altitude. And it's going to get us to a pretty comfortable altitude pretty quick. So obviously, if we travel higher, the aircraft travels faster because we have thinner air. But... Remember that wind that's literally blowing out of the direction that we're trying to travel in? The higher we go, the more effective that wind is going to be at actually blocking us from going any faster. So you want to keep that in your mind as well. Now, if we were traveling from Hartford to Groton, we'd want to get as high as we can so that this wind pushes us. But as it stands at this exact moment, the wind is actually going to be fighting us. So we need to stay as low as possible for this flight. So I'm thinking 2,500 feet is probably going to be the safest altitude for us. So I'm going to go ahead and make myself a quick little note here. And we're looking pretty good. All right. So uh, now we need to go think about our cruise settings. Now, this is in the old days. What you would actually have to do is you'd have to go ahead and get yourself a POH, and you'd have to study these really, really complicated charts in order to determine what power setting we should use. Now, the good news is, is you've got this website called POH Performance, which I've showed off before, and it does a dynamite job of basically doing all this work for you. In this particular case, if I go to En Route and just click on More Edit, it even tells me this is the RPM you want to use for full power. And this, of course, is going to be your total power. This is going to be your fuel flow. This is going to be our true airspeed. This is how much fuel it's going to use. Everything is automatically calculated for you, which is wonderful. So we want to make a note of this RPM. Now, on my performance thing over here, I'm just going to make a quick note. 25 funny RPM. Actually, I'm sorry. We're going to say 74% cruise. We're gonna, we don't know what the manifold pressure is. We know that it's 2,520, uh, and we know the gallons per hour is going to be 21, and we know our airspeed is gonna be 116. Where did I just get that from? Take a look right here. Airspeed, 116, fuel flow, 10.1, power setting, 2520, 74%. Now, different aircraft are going to have different settings for this. By the way, at any point, you can come in here and dial in all your frequencies, but we will do that next time. So let's go ahead and take a look here. There's also another place for your weather, should you need it right here. But again, we haven't even gotten to that step yet. I told you this is going to be a three-parter, so you can probably imagine how insane this can get if you're trying to plan out entire flights with 30 or 40 individual waypoints. But again, once you get the hang of it, it doesn't take too long. All right, let's take a look how we're doing here. Um, we've got that figured out. Are we flying up from the clouds? We do. Do I have time to climb and descend? Absolutely, I have enough time to climb and descend. But the climb is going to be a little dangerous because of those antennas. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and stop my video here. Now, the reason I'm stopping my video here is this component of the actual flight is actually going to take us almost as long as everything so far. The interesting thing is it's going to take us longer to plan for this flight than it's going to take us to actually fly this flight. Now, that's just kind of a not uncommon situation when you're doing dead reckoning. And uh, oh, we have to change this too. And the reason for that is, like I said, because there's so many individual things you have to do. Now, once you get in the plane, this whole flight is going to go very smoothly because we're going to have so much solid information that we can use in order to safely plan it. All right, uh, hopefully this has been uh, fairly clear so far. Again, there's different resources for folks who are planning flights outside. And I'm just going to kind of leave you with this real quick. There's this neat button right here on uh, Sky Vector. It says Navlog. If you click that button, it'll actually display graphically in this nice little handy dandy way exactly what the expected wind speeds are automatically calculated and automatically interpolated for you, assuming you set your altitude and your true speed. I know some of you are saying, I'm just going to do that. But the whole point of this was to see all the different pieces that goes into planning one of these flights. Enjoy.